Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome to this week's EKG. Got a good case for you today. This is straight from Rescue 5. We had an 89-year-old female with a history of hypertension and high cholesterol who, when the rescue gets there, says she was feeling really dizzy as she was walking into her apartment and she fell in the parking lot and hit her head on a parked car nearby. The rescue does a good job and quickly moves to get a set of vital signs. They notice that her heart rate is 95. Her blood pressure is 195 over 98, so a little bit high. Respiratory rate's 22 with a normal oxygen saturation and an acceptable blood glucose level. I'm really proud of these guys because even though she had a mechanical fall and a head injury, they were suspicious of a possible syncopal episode and went ahead and got a 12 lead EKG, which is totally appropriate in this circumstance. Anytime somebody's dizzy or weak or possibly fell, go ahead and get the 12 lead and see if that could be the cause. And so here's what they found. I'll give you a second to take a look at it if you want to come up with your own diagnosis and then we'll go through it together. First thing we start with is rate, just like always, we'll let the computer do the work. I see a rate of 86, just wanna make sure I agree with that. So I'm gonna find a QRS that lines up with a thick red line. I see one right here. We're gonna count down 300, 150, 175, so it's between 75 and 100. I agree with the rate somewhere around the 80s. We will call this a rate of 86. Next, we move on to our rhythm. If you remember here, we're always asking ourselves two questions. First is, is this originating from the sinoatrial node? So I'm looking for P waves to indicate that, and the best place to find those is in lead two. I do see P waves in lead two. They're a little fuzzy, but they're there. And then do I see them before every QRS? I'm pretty sure that I do. They look like they're all the way across the precordium here. Um, so I will call this a sinus rhythm. Next question, is this regular or irregular? Uh, first, you can kind of do the eyeball test, look and make sure that the distance between your QRS complexes is uh, about the same with each beat. Looks the same to me. I don't have my piece of paper here to check, but I'm not really suspicious, so I'm not gonna pursue it at this point. I'll say we have a regular sinus rhythm. Moving on to axis. So this is where we look at leads one and AVF. Lead one, if you remember, is my left thumb. I'm looking at the majority of the QRS vector. In lead one, the majority of that vector is up. Positive direction, I'm gonna give a left thumbs up. Now I look at AVF, again, looking at the majority of the QRS vector. I will call this one down. So what am I left with? My left thumb is up. I have left axis deviation here. All right, and then intervals. So the first one we look at is QRS. This is where I'm thankful for the computer. QRS is 94. I want that to be less than 120. Fantastic, it's nice and narrow. I think that's good. Not gonna chase that anymore. And then a QTC, I want it less than 450. At 500, I get nervous. She's well within the range of normal at 405. So I will call those normal intervals. Moving on to our ST segments, looking here, I always start with my inferior leads first, that's just my habit, but looked at them in territories. So 2-3 AVF, any ST elevations or depressions, that looks like that's pretty much along the baseline there. Uh, in the inferior leads, same thing in the high lateral leads with 1 and AVL. Moving over towards the septal leads and the anterior leads, same thing. Um, I'm not really seeing any ST elevations or depressions. They look like they're all along the baseline there. Um, I will say that those look normal. So what are we left with here? Well, in conclusion, for our 12 lead on this lady that fell and hit her head, it looks like a normal sinus rhythm with a rate of 86, and the only abnormality I see on here is left axis deviation. So you may be asking yourself, what does that mean? And I'm going to try to not get super complicated here because it can get a little bit tricky to explain. And if you can go back to your days when maybe you took a physics class, and I'll be the first to admit I was not really strong at physics, but vectors are the thing that has magnitude and direction and describe the direction of a force. And this is exactly what we're looking at in the heart. And so when you think about the way that a heart contracts, 
the direction and the magnitude of the force in general goes towards the left ventricle, right? That's your big muscle with the most power that's depolarizing the most forcefully. A normal heart is going to have the most forceful, biggest sum of the vectors going towards the left, right? But when a heart depolarizes, you have smaller vectors going all the way around the heart in a different circle, right? There's vectors going in every direction to help that heart depolarize. But in general, when you sum up those vectors, it should be going generally to the left. And we just assign degrees to that, and so that would be somewhere between negative 30 and 90 when we're looking at the heart. And if you look at this, it makes sense when we determine our axis, why we look at leads 1 and leads AVF, because they are perfectly positioned over the direction that a normal axis should be facing. And so when that depolarization, that wave, is coming towards leads 1, that's where we get our thumbs up. And when that depolarization is coming towards AVF, we get our two thumbs up. So if it's between these two, with vectors that are going the right way, we get two thumbs up, that's a normal axis. Now if something was to happen in the heart, and there's a very variety of things that can happen that make those vectors change, um, to change the magnitude of the depolarization in a different direction. And so one of those can just happen with age. That ca it can be normal to have a left axis deviation as you get older. Um, but one of, some of the more typical ones we see with diseased hearts have to do with either left ventricular hypertrophy, which is a topic for a different day. That's a lot of high blood pressure prolonged over time or conduction defects with either a left bundle branch block or a left anterior fascicular block. Could also suggest that there's been a myocardial infarction or sometimes the heart can physically twist in the chest, like if someone has a big belly from either being pregnant or ascites from liver failure or something like that can physically change the vectors in the chest as well. Um, but what we're looking at here is something, especially in this lady, if you look a little bit closer, what we find is that she's actually got a left anterior fascicular block. And so what happens when this heart depolarizes, if you remember, there's a signal that comes from sinoatrial node to the AV node, goes through the, through the bundle of Hiss, and then there's the right bundle, and there's a left anterior fascicle and a left posterior fascicle. Well, her left anterior fascicle is sick. So the criteria for a left anterior fascicular block, and this is a textbook definition, I don't expect you to memorize it, but in the setting of left axis deviation, so you've got your vector up in lead one, down in AVF, you also have a big R wave, which we already know because our thumbs are up in lead one, and also AVL. And then you look for S waves in two, three, and AVF, and we do have um, downward S waves in those leads as well. So that would technically meet criteria for left anterior fascicular block. And so that's what we're looking at. That's why axis, one of the reasons why axis deviation is important. And uh, hopefully that makes sense. And that's all for this week. That's left axis deviation with a left anterior fascicular block. Hope you can join us next week for more.